Republicans have a supermajority in the Iowa Senate. We'll talk about their 2024 priorities and plans for key legislation with Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitmer on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite's 1,600 employees are our company's greatest asset. A family-run business, Elite supports volunteerism, encourages promotions from within, and shares profits with our employees. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, February 2nd edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. Our guest on this edition of Iowa Press was elected leader of Senate Republicans in March of 2018. This past November, he was re-elected to the Iowa Senate for a fourth term. Senate Majority Leader Jack Whitmer, welcome back to Iowa Press. Thank you for having me. Also joining the conversation, Stephen Gruber-Miller of the Des Moines Register and Katerina Sestarek of Iowa Public Radio. Senator, an amended version of the governor's plan to overhaul special education got through a Senate subcommittee this week, but a Republican senator took the original version of the bill and threw it in a trash can. Is that indicative of Republicans' feelings about this bill and how it was rolled out? Well, in the Senate, you know, we got it through this in the subcommittee, and so we are continuing to work on it. Um, I think there's a lot of people in our caucus that are excited to make some reforms. There's some that have a lot of questions, and so I think it really indicates more of just the normal legislative process where the, the two sides are going to disagree and um, we're going to have to work with the governor and find some solution, but uh, I'm optimistic we can do that. House Speaker Pat Grassley says there needs to be a reset in the conversation about this bill. Do you think you need to start from scratch on, you know, trying to improve special education in Iowa? Well, the bill's been largely rewritten in the last couple of weeks, and so I don't know about starting from scratch because it is a totally different bill now than it was, you know, three weeks ago. Um, but there, we're going to have to continue the conversation and, and make the case why these reforms are necessary if it's going to become law. One of the concerns that some people have about this bill is that uh, the larger sort of urban school districts will be more easily able to sort of opt out from the AEA system because there are other service providers in their areas and that money will make it harder for a, the losing that money will make it harder for the AEAs to provide services to rural schools. Do you think the bill adequately addresses that? Well, I mean, that's what we're looking at, but I mean, there's almost $600 million in the AEA system. So if, if some of the schools opt out, I think there's still a lot of money in there to, to make sure that services are being given to students all over the state. But that's certainly one thing that we're hearing from our rural members. Another part of that bill would raise teacher pay for starting teachers, first year teachers, to $50,000 a year. Is that number something Senate Republicans can support? Yeah, we're still talking about that, but I think there is a desire to um, raise teacher pay at some point, the, the minimum teacher pay. We did it maybe six, seven, eight years ago, and it's probably time to do that again. And so uh, there's interest in, in raising teacher pay. Um, it's just what the number is, is still be, to be determined. So do you think it'll get up to 50000 or will it be? I don't know. It's hard to say. It's, it's hard to say at this point. What about the timeline that the governor laid out in this AEA reorganization bill? Um, is it too aggressive? Because yeah. schools would have to decide in June what they're going to do for the next school year. Yeah, I understand why she did it because, you know, when you only are in legislative session for three to four months a year, when there's timelines that come come during the year, we just kind of have to adapt. And, you know, if she's setting an April deadline or a May deadline, it's because that's when we're in session, we have to do it quick. And so um, I'm not worried about that. It might cause more schools under the current bill to just not opt, not opt out at all, just continue services as, as, as it is. And then maybe next year, start looking at what they want to, to opt out of. Um, this past week, the leaders of the Senate and House committees that draft tax policy came out with a plan that would, they, they say, provide a glide path to getting rid of the state income tax. 
The governor has a completely different plan that she presented to you last month um, that would speed up already approved um, tax cuts for um, individual taxpayers. What are you going to do? Well, you know, this is this is really the normal legislative process, right? The last couple of years, we've got kind of spoiled and you just have agreed to bills from the House Senate governor and we just pass them really quick. Th that's not the normal process, uh, as you guys know about about the building. And so you're just going to have different different proposals that we're just going to have to work through them. And then we'll, I'm sure that we'll be taking ideas from the governor. We'll take the ideas from the House and Senate and hopefully have a really good tax bill um, by the end of the year. I think the great thing, though, is that we're talking about expediting these tax cuts, you know, um, five years ago when we passed the original tax cuts, everyone said, these aren't sustainable, you're on a uh, bobsled to bankruptcy was what the, de the Democrats said about it. And the reality is, is now we're in a position to speed them up and start talking about what's next. And so that's where we are, we, where we are right now in the session, and uh, we'll continue to work with the governor and, and the House to find a, a really good solution. Well, last year, um, the Senate Ways and Means Committee did pass a bill that set up a framework for getting to zero by the end of the decade. Um, do you anticipate that legislators will take some vote this year or just go out and talk with voters about these are our ideas? Um, I think it's still a little early to tell. This is probably an issue that will be settled at the, towards the end of session uh, in the close down. And so it's a little early to tell. You know, the governor wants to be a little bit more aggressive right now, getting more money back into the pockets of Iowans. And I understand that. I think that's a great goal. Um, in the Senate and House bill, we talk about how do we get to zero and, and how long that will take. And so um, that's just something that we'll have to work with the House and Governor. On, around before we find solution. You took action to keep transgender people out of girls sports and also certain school bathrooms. And now the governor is proposing a bill that could keep, <clears throat> excuse me, now the governor is proposing a bill that could keep transgender people from other public facilities that align with their gender identity. Do you think the legislature needs to go further with this issue? Well, you know, that's to be determined. You know, the bill just came out in the last couple of days, so we're taking a look at it. Um, but it's something that I know a lot of our people would be interested in, but I, it's too early right now to predict on what will happen with that. It seems like a lot of these bills related to transgender Iowans have been based on this idea that um, some people have that allowing transgender people to participate in public life in a way that aligns with their gender identity um, is somehow, um, you know, stepping on the rights of, of people who aren't transgender. Um, this bill from the governor also would include, um, would require including people's sex changes on driver's license and driver's licenses and birth certificates. How does that line up with the rationale for these other bills related to trans individuals? Well, I mean, in, in, in some regards, the, the bills address issues where um, the rights of transgendered are are conflicting with the rights of of non-transgendered athletes or athletes for example you know you have girls that are playing girl sports and all of a sudden there's a transgendered girl playing those sports that's a conflict of of rights and so that's kind of what you're dealing with it, uh, with this situation and you know so we'll see where it goes but um, definitely it will be something our people will be interested in on the topic of eminent domain the house has introduced uh, a bill that would allow 20% of uh, Iowa senators or 20% of Iowa House members to essentially halt ongoing eminent domain proceedings for a particular project. Uh, it's a different approach than they've taken last year. Is that something the Senate will take up? Yeah, I, I personally don't support that bill. That That is giving, giving um, the power to a super, super, super minority of, of the chamber. And if you can have 11 senators decide what happens in state policy. I just don't think that's a good proposal. Um, that's not to say that there won't be any conversation on eminent, dom eminent domain or um, property rights, but I think giving the power to 11 senators, that's an undemocratic way to go about it. Another part of that bill would uh, allow landowners or companies who are involved in eminent domain proceedings to get a quicker resolution from the courts about whether eminent domain is proper for that particular piece of land. Do you think that's something that you would support? Um, anything that can make government more efficient and, and get a, a, a faster result, um, I would be interested in. I haven't read that specific part yet to, to give a final position. The governor um, told me at Radio Iowa that she's open to changes for future projects, but nothing should be retroactive. Is that your approach in the Iowa Senate? Yeah, in the Iowa Senate, you know, we have people all over the board on this, which is why you haven't seen uh, any legislation passed to this point. There's people that want to make changes now and they don't want the pipeline, period. You have people that don't want eminent domain for the pipeline, but they're okay with the pipeline. Then there's people that think this is really important for the future of Iowa. And so it's really a split caucus, which is why you haven't seen action to this point. 
one of your members um, told some radio stations that they're interested in making sure that the land is restored after the pipeline is put in. Is that something that you might do separately? Yeah, I mean, there, there. I think bills filed um, regarding that, and I think that that is totally appropriate type, you know, type of legislation to pass right now. Um, if this pipeline is going to happen, we absolutely want the land restored. I mean, that's there's there's only a finite amount of land in this state, and we need to protect it. And so, ideas like that, I think, would have a, a good chance. Um, Senator Whitver, you played football at Iowa State University, and you did probably not use your smartphone. Did you have a smartphone to place I don't place think bets? they even existed at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your view of the depart of the Division of Criminal Investigation investigating the gambling on the part of male athletes at Iowa State and the University of Iowa? Yeah, I mean, this is a complicated issue, and we're still trying to get facts that come out of it, and I think, ultimately, you're going to see most of those facts come out in a court case, probably. It sure looks like the athletes are going to sue, and a lot of those, those, those facts of the case will come out in that lawsuit, and so um, certainly watching it um, very intently. Um, especially to see if we need to change anything. But it's a complicated issue because it's not just the state of Iowa. You know, the only punishment from the state of Iowa on any of these athletes was, you know, a five, six hundred dollar fine. The other part of it is the NCAA and the punishments that come down from the NCAA for any of these violations. And so uh, it is complicated, certainly watching it close to see if we need to do anything. What, what do you envision doing? <laughs> well, I don't know yet. I mean, um, if there's violations as far as um, the constitutional rights of the members, we, we may have to do something. I don't know. But um, like I said, largely this is going to be sorted out in the courts. Senator, Senate Republicans have declined to have an oversight hearing on nursing home oversight as, there, you know, we've seen in the media just some reports of some awful things happening to some nursing home residents um, and Senate Democrats wanted to have an oversight hearing. If you're not going to have that sort of hearing, um, what will you do to improve oversight at nursing homes in Iowa? Oh, we're, we're working with the department, talking to the department all the time. And if you hear issues, we're bringing it up with them. We're seeing what we can do better. Um, there's not really a more regulated industry. <laughs> There's very few re more regulated industries in the state of Iowa than the nursing homes, both at the state and the federal level. So um, I think there's proper oversight on the nursing homes right now. The House has been advancing a bill that would allow people to have cameras in their nursing home rooms so that, you know, their families can check in on them, things yep. like that. Would you be open to advancing that in the Senate? Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting concept that we're willing to look at. Um, depending on how it's written and how it works and if if people have an uh, ability to opt out not everyone wants a camera in their room all the time and so there's some privacy issues that go on here too so interested to see what they're going to do with this bill but um, don't have an opinion yet on the issue of immigration the senate has several years now passed a bill that would require businesses to use the e-verify system to check whether their employees are in the country legally yeah. it's never passed the house with all the attention on immigration this year and the presidential election coming up, do you think this is the year that it could get done? Well, I know we have a bill that is alive. I think it's through subcommittee and maybe even through committee at this point or, or, or close to. And so in the Senate, it will, it will be a live round. Um, I, I'm not positive, you know, when we, when we film this, I haven't looked at everything that happened all week, but I think the House might have had a subcommittee on it and maybe it didn't pass. And so if it doesn't pass the House, you know, I don't know how, how much further we'll go, but um, it's something that our caucus has been interested in for five or six years, um, but a lot of it's going to be determined by the House. And businesses pretty much every year when the bill comes up raise issues with implementing that system. They say the E-Verify system has uh, accuracy issues, um, that those haven't been improved at the federal level yet, so they don't support impro uh, implementing it at the state. I mean, is there anything that you could do about that? Well, I could tell you, I've, I've owned a business that that used E-Verify, and we had to um, in the business, and it worked fine. Every time I've used it, probably with 100 employees or more, it worked perfect. And so uh, I'm not as worried about that. Uh, I am sympathetic to the, the arguments that government, you guys are putting so many rules and regulations on us, we don't need one more. And that is an argument that uh, some of the businesses are making. Um, they say we we don't hire illegals. We never have, and but now we still have to go through this this whole process. And so I'm sympathetic to that, that argument. But no, going through this process before, it's a very very quick process. It takes probably a, a minute or two to get it done. So I don't think it's overly burdensome. There's also a House bill that would say uh, that undocumented students 
would not qualify for in-state tuition at the state's regent universities or community colleges. Do you think that would have support in the Senate? Um, I, I think it'd have a good chance. And frankly, I was a little bit surprised to read that. I didn't know that they, they were getting in-state tuition, and maybe that's just an oversight by me, but it's something I didn't know about. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, if our members started looking at that. Um, the Regents institutions have made changes in regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Are those sufficient or do you expect to pass some sort of legislation? I know there's people talking about whether we want to codify the, that DEI proposals that have come from the Regents. I don't know that anyone's talking about going further. I think that largely the Regents have done a, a good job on everything in, in, in the last couple of years, but this is an area that they, they took to heart. They went and, and really put together a good um, DEI plan. And so I think any conversation will be about whether we codify that or we just leave that in the department rules. Moving on to another subject, you have a colleague in Brad Zahn who has tried for the past 13 years to either <laughs> outlaw traffic cameras or regulate them. He's persistent, yes. What will the legislature do that in 2024? I don't know. I mean, um, in the Senate, we have passed a bill to ban. We have passed a bill to regulate. We passed all kinds of ideas over the last couple of years. Um, this year, it seems like they're partnering up um, a ban with a hands-free legislation. I don't know that that usually works because you get two issues that your people are split on and then it's hard to match together the, the 26 votes that you need. Um, but there, you know, Brad has been very persistent on this and there is a, a decent amount of support in our caucus to, to ban the traffic cams. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised to see those bills come forward. There was the tragic school shooting in Perry earlier this year, um, and you know people have been calling for some kind of action. People may disagree on what that should be. It seems like you know Republicans in the Iowa legislature don't want to take action on guns, um, but there has been also conversations about school safety. Um, what will Senate Republicans do this year to you know tackle that issue of making schools safer so people don't have to worry when their kids are going off to school in the morning? Yeah, in the last in the last I don't know 18 months to two years I don't know the exact time frame the governor has put forward a hundred million dollars um, of federal money to school safety and put it out there the schools had to come back with safety plans and um, show the state what they're doing for that for the safety of the school and then they get they get grants to implement those. Um, not that many schools have actually done that to this point. And I think that's the number one focus is getting those school safety plans finished, getting them approved and getting them implemented. And I, I think that's what Senate Republicans will focus on because there is a hundred million dollars ready to be implemented to make our schools safer. And, and I think that's what we should start with. How do you speed that up? Well, I mean, it's largely on, you know, urgency from the schools. And so talking to the schools, and I assume the Department of Education will talk to schools on the tragic situations like we just had in Perry, hopefully would encourage people to, to speed that up if they could. Mental health is also a big topic when it, you know, that people talk about when it comes to school shootings. Um, the governor has proposed merging substance use disorder districts with mental health regions and creating this whole new behavioral health system. Do you think that will help mental health and children's mental health, will that help prevent, you know, tragedies like this in the future? Yeah, I mean, one thing we know is we always have to continue working on mental health. Like, you don't just pass a bill and, and solve the problem with mental health. And, you know, I gotta give the governor a lot of credit on this issue. The very first speech she gave as governor, she got sworn in, went to the rotunda of the Capitol, gave a speech, and she pr proposed the first children's mental health program in the history of our state. We didn't have a children's mental health program. Um, but you can propose it, you can, you can pass it, but you still have to continue to work on it, fund it, implement it. And so um, uh, we're going to continue to do that. We'll continue to increase funding every year like we have been. It's, it's actually automatic in the, in the legislature. It's not like every other appropriation where you have to go in and decide if you want to give more money. It's an automatic increase for mental health. But it's something that's really important. And um, I know that we've taken a lot of focus on the children's mental health aspect. Hospital officials say they still have people who are in emergency rooms waiting for a psychiatric bed and the system that the state set up to help them find an opening somewhere just isn't working. Is that a focus of something that you need to fix in 2024? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we need to continue to work on. You know, that's been a problem for forever. It's not something that's happened in the last couple of years and we need to continue to work on it. And, and we've tried. Um, and like I said, this is a, an issue that you're not gonna pass a bill and solve it all. We need to continue to, to work on it. 
The governor has proposed this year uh, extending postpartum Medicaid coverage for new mothers to a full year after giving birth. Uh, currently, Iowa offers just two months of Medicaid coverage. The governor's proposal also suggests lowering uh, the ceiling for who can qualify for that, so less people would get coverage, but they would get it longer. Is that uh, something the Senate sees as the right approach? Well, in the Senate, we have passed a version of, of, of this proposal a couple of times, and um, it hasn't passed the House to this point, and so it's definitely something our members are interested in. I know Mark Costello, um, our, our chair in this area, is really interested in it. He's passed that bill, I think, twice now, and so um, I, I would imagine the Senate's going to be interested in some sort of proposal. I don't know exactly what that will be yet. Would they be okay with lowering that income threshold? Oh, I haven't had that conversation with them, and so it's a little early to predict, but I know it's something that they care about and are interested in. In the middle of the 1990s, the Iowa House narrowly passed a bill that would have reinstated capital punishment for a limited number of crimes in Iowa. It failed in the Iowa Senate. You have some Senate colleagues who are proposing a bill that would reinstate capital punishment in Iowa. Is that going to happen? You know, this is something that has been a, a part of the conversation since we took the majority eight years ago. Um, there is a, a pretty sizable amount of our caucus that would like to reinstate that for very limited purposes, whether it's murder, uh, rape and murder of a kid or a police officers. Um, but to this point, we've had enough uh, people that just don't support that. They say I'm pro-life, whether, you know, from natural birth to natural death and have just resisted that. I would, I would guess we still have enough people in our caucus that resist that to, to make that happen this year. Um, also, the governor has proposed um, a bill that would require the Secretary of State to comb through land records and determine if there are secret ways, loopholes, that federal governments and foreigners have used by being part of a U.S. corporation to buy Iowa farmland. Current law prohibits foreigners from owning more than 320 acres. The report that in the governor's bill that would be required from the Secretary of State would keep that information secret and share it with you as legislators and the governor. Do you think that, led, that information should be public? Um, I don't know. We haven't talked enough about it. I, I know there's interest from our people to continue to work on these land laws. Um, I do know Iowa has some of the strongest laws uh, related to foreign ownership of any state in the country. So I think we're in pretty good shape. But um, the governor continuing to push on that, I think, is something that our members are interested in. I think Iowans are interested, especially uh, with the national security aspect. And so um, I I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the proposal and the privacy of it, but as far as the overall proposal of continuing to, um, to protect that from, from foreign ownership, I think we're definitely interested in that. Looking ahead to this year's elections, um, Senate Democrats say that they're going to tell voters that you are too extreme on abortion. Um, will that hurt you in the November elections? Yeah, you know, I'm very confident going into the, the 2024 elections. We've had several good cycles in a row now. We went from 24 to 29 to 32 to 34. I mean, at some point you can't keep growing. There's only so many seats that we can get. But um, I think we've had a message, um, especially on the economy, that Iowans believe and they see the results. I mean, Iowa is, is probably in, in the strongest position um, maybe it's ever been in and we have the biggest surplus we've ever had and so um, we're going to tell our story we're proud of our story um, we're proud of our story that you know uh, of what we've done in the majority and we, what we've done with the trifecta and i feel very confident about the elections this year do you think voters won't be voting based on abortion rights i mean some will of course and but i think uh, you know voters vote how they you know how they end up voting for a lot of different reasons but overall if you take the big picture of what republicans have been working on and pushing the last eight years. Um, voters have rewarded us and I think they're going to continue to. The Iowa Secretary of State has a bill that would uh, essentially limit the grounds for challenging a presidential candidate's place on the ballot in Iowa. Uh, this might preclude people going through the ballot challenge process to President Trump, for instance, on 14th Amendment grounds like we've seen in other states. Will that bill get assigned to a committee or get a hearing in the Senate? Um, I would guess it would get a, a hearing, yes. Um, I don't know enough about the bill, but what I do know about the whole presidential election, it's become so um, politicized, and I know it's a political campaign, that's what they do, but um, the, the means that they're trying to use to keep President Trump 
off the ballot, from running again, from becoming president again, uh, is something that our voters are concerned about. And so um, I'd be very interested in, in that bill coming down from Secretary of State. Are you publicly endorsing President Trump as he seeks re-election? Yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty apparent at this point that he's going to be the nominee. Um, would publicly endorse him today or anytime. Um, I think he's our best chance to win this election this year and have no problem doing that. What about Jack Whitver? Do you intend to seek some other office once this current term <laughs> I is up? I still have three years on this term and, um, you know, I like what I'm doing right now. I think we're making a difference what we're doing. And so, uh, you know, this election coming up is going to be big for the, the presidency, but it's big for, for some of our members and in our caucus. And so I've been staying focused on that. Well, Jack Whitver, thank you for being on this edition of Iowa Press. Thank you. You can watch every episode of Iowa Press online at iowapbs.org. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is a family-run business rooted in Iowa. We believe our employees are part of our family, and we strive to improve their quality of life and the quality of lives within the communities we serve. Across Iowa, Hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com.